Good morning, this is Ben Caton with Clarity Farms Grazing 365, coming to you from Central Arkansas. We've just made our second move of the day. That was our first break back there, and we've moved them in here. They've been in here for about five minutes. <clears throat> They're just getting after it. I uh, wanted to touch on a couple things today. Um, and, and really, it's, it's, I want to point something out so that you can learn from my mistakes. Um, so it took me probably far too long to learn this. And as I tell you, most of you are going to think, well, that's just common sense. You know, how, how, how dumb can you be, Ben? Um, but for those of you who uh, are as slow as me or not much faster than me, this is for you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and walk up to their next break to kind of demonstrate this. So at first glance, this pasture looks like there's a, you know, just a tremendous amount of biomass in there. Just a lot of grass. And if we were to get down at this angle, it just looks like a wall of grass, a wall of perennial rye, wall of wheat. But if we were to take a different view straight down looking into this pasture you will see that it's actually pretty thin people tend to fixate when assessing a pasture and they're grazing folks tend to fixate at least i did on the height of the grass you know what height do you want to graze the grass um, and, you know, so I, I get that. I understand that. But when you're calculating how much you want to give them, you really need to look at the density and the spacing between your plants. Now, most of this is stuff that we drilled last fall when we first secured this lease, knowing there wouldn't be much here to graze until the warm season stuff kicked in. And because of that, it's, it's fairly thin. But one of the huge advantages to grazing the way that we are grazing, you know, grazing in a non-selective way, is that when you take down, so this is where we were yesterday, had a lot of rain, got between uh, noon today and uh, dark tomorrow night we're supposed to get anywhere from three to five inches of rain so we're uh making some accommodations for that but i want to want to show so one of the great things about grazing this way is that when you open up the canopy you're not only opening it up so that the you know the shorter stuff can get some sunlight it's it's the best way to decrease the spacing in between your plants. You don't just want tall forage, you want tall, thick forage. And if you're only grazing half and leaving half, or if you're grazing a third and leaving two thirds, you'll start to see the spacing in between your plants spread out. The same way if we were to look at, uh, you know, down there in the woods, there was some pasture that we just let go. What we would find is, you know, eventually, saplings would pop up and they would be really densely packed in i mean just a you know a, different, a sapling every few inches and then as those trees grew taller and taller and taller the more dominant trees would start to shade out the less dominant trees and the stand would begin to thin well that's the same thing that happens in your pasture if you if you don't ever expose uh you know the majority of your pasture to sunlight you're just going to get a lot of really tall plants that will start to shade out the the uh you know some of the newer plants and you're going to end up with uh, you know fewer and fewer plants per square foot but by grazing this way during the time of year or during the year that we graze it intensively we'll see more and more plants grass plants per square foot and then the next year when that pasture gets a year off those new plants with decreased spacing in between them will we'll have an 
opportunity to go a year and mature and become established and, and grow deeper roots and fatter roots. So it's sort of a one-two punch. You hit the you hit the pastures hard to increase the number of plants, and then you give it a year off so that those new plants can uh, mature and strengthen. And then you come back the next year and you graze it tightly again. You have even more plants to graze this time. And as you take it down, you'll see more and more uh, plants per square foot. And it's just a cycle. Uh, uh, if you look at Josh Teague's uh, YouTube channel, Running Tea Farms, he grew a stockpile last year that is better than any stockpile I've ever seen. And I would guarantee you that uh, year one, he didn't get anywhere near that stockpile because not only was the soil probably not as healthy, he probably had less, or I should say more spacing in between his plants. But, you know, if you do that for four or five years, you start getting more and more plants per square foot. And then you're giving them that year off after you've increased the number of plants to, to establish themselves and grow those deep roots that, that help you infiltrate water better, help you hold water better, and helps you survive those droughts because those fat roots are deep. And when you do graze them off, those fatter roots, as they slough off, that's where you get that organic matter in your soil. And it's the organic matter and increasing that organic matter that not only adds fertility to your soil, but it adds a lot of water holding capacity. For every 1% of organic matter that you increase in your soil, each acre will hold roughly 20,000 additional gallons of water and you'll infiltrate it much better. So, you know, is, it, don't just fixate on the height of the grass. Fixate just as much on the spacing between your plants. And you know, I've had some people comment on how great our pastures look, but they really aren't great. This farm is certainly degraded and we, the soil is running a fever and feels like garbage. If, if it were a human being, it, it's, it's running 102 temperature. This soil needs these animals and these hooves, and it needs the, the, the recovery that we're putting into the, uh, the areas that we're not grazing. Uh, so I wanted to touch on that today. And one other thing I wanted to touch on regarding this style of grazing. So one of the criticisms of this style of grazing by grazing everything down is, well, what are you gonna do when you hit a drought? You know, if you've grazed everything down and you don't get any rain, what are you gonna do? You have nothing left to graze. You gotta start selling cows. Anyone who makes that comment is probably very well-meaning, but they probably don't understand how this method works. Keep in mind, there's always at least half the farm that has not been touched. So if you get into a drought, You've got half your farm that's been you know growing all spring all summer and you now you know you now have to start dipping into that but you have to be disciplined you cannot fall asleep at the wheel you've got to have that discipline to know okay i've run out of grass where i'm grazing i'm starting to dip into my stockpile and it's just august uh i think i better go ahead and very systematically start reducing the size of my herd you know, grazing this way, if you graze your entire farm that way, 100% of the farm every year intensively, yes, I could see where, uh, you know, drought would cause, you know, a major issue. But keep in mind, you have half the farm. And the irony is some of the biggest uh, opponents to this style of grazing who, who comment, well, why do you do in a drought? Ask those folks, well, what do you do when you get into a drought? Well, the first thing they'll tell you is, well, we tighten them up. We move them through the farm a lot slower and we graze everything down and hope that that buys time for the rest of the farm to recover. So basically what they do when they get into a drought is start grazing the way we graze from day one. You know, we graze that way year round. So why wait until you're in a drought to graze in a way that, uh, that maximizes your farm and your animal performance during a drought? Why not just always assume there's a drought around the corner?
So not only is this, is this method not particularly susceptible to drought more than other methods, but this is actually the way to maximize your farm and animal performance should there be a drought. It's, it's never escaped me the irony of folks who say, well, when you get into a drought, tighten them up, bunch them up, move them as slow as you can, and graze you know, those paddocks down, and that will buy you more time for the farm to recover. That's exactly what we're doing every day here. We graze them tight, and we're only grazing half the farm in any given year, or during any given growing season. So we always have the other half of the farm to dip into when we get into a drought. So I, I think folks who criticize this method of grazing are well-meaning. I just don't think they quite understand that nuance to what we're doing. You know, we're not grazing the entire farm down throughout the year. We're just grazing half of it. So having said all of that, I wanna thank all of our subscribers. If you're not one, please subscribe, it helps us out. Uh, liking the video helps us out even more. So please like the video, subscribe, click the bell. That'll notify you every time we come out with a video. The comments, everyone, they have been awesome. Uh, we're getting just a, a crazy amount of comments. Uh, and I, I, I'm so thankful. Not only are the comments great, we have zero toxicity. You know, just everyone's just so polite. Uh, no, <laughs> no jerks in our comments. So please comment. If there's a video or something you want us to cover or questions you've got, comments are the best way to, to ask those questions. But also, the suggestions we're getting uh, have been super helpful. Uh, and we're well aware there are many people doing what we're doing, and most of them are probably doing better than we are. Uh, so we would love to hear anything that we can do to improve either our herd, the way we manage our grass, the way we manage our soil. We want to be lifelong learners and we want to be good stewards here at Clarity Farms. So with all of that, I wish you all a good day. Thank you.